anyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here for this wonderful conversation. Not only is it great to get Bishop Curry and Canon Spellers with us, but for them to be able to stay a little while and to um, talk about some, some of their work and some of the things going on in the church is a great blessing to all of us. So thank you both for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So just as way of introduction, I know many people know this, but Bishop Michael Curry is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and uh, Canon Stephanie Spellers is the canon for evangelism, reconciliation, and the stewardship of creation for the presiding bishop. And um, thank you both for joining us this morning. So I just want to begin with a big question. So as you're traveling around the church, because I know you're on the road all the time, and as you're traveling around the wider church, what are some of the things that you're seeing that give you the most sense of excitement and hope and some of the things that you're seeing that sort of raise a little concern for you? Well, thank you again for, thank you, Dean, for having us. And, and, um, and I always am blessed to be here. How are we doing? Oh. Yeah, sure do. Can you hear us okay? You wonder how Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount with uh, uh, one of these. <laughs> it's, uh, I was just saying thank you for um, just your always, your hospitality and, and welcome. It's a joy to be here. You know, I really am blessed um, to be able to travel the church and uh, both in terms of our church, the Episcopal Church, um, and, and in our wider Anglican communion as well. Um, one thing I can tell you off the top of my head, I don't think I have been in the Atlanta airport and not run into an Episcopalian. <laughs> so I know where we hang out. Um, but, but I get to travel around the church um, both and spend time both everything from diocesan conventions to ordination and consecrations of new bishops to um, actually I was able to do I don't get to do confirmation as much as I used to but I was in San Francisco and um, uh, we had an echo Bishop Andrews said would you mind doing an echo com confirmation I said uh, Bishop what is an echo confirmation I knew I was in California so I knew it would be something new and, I, and then I also added I said please don't do anything that I'm gonna have to get email about later um, but it was wonderful we were out in a park and people brought confirmants from all of the churches together and um, it was just a remarkable experience. I was part of an um, eco-justice conference that was happening there. Um, and then, I mean, I've, I've been able to spend time, and that's a sign of hope. There were people being um, confirmed um, who had just, adults who had just been baptized um, during at Easter, um, who were there for confirmation. Um, and this is in San Francisco, in California. Um, I then um, have spent time um, at the Niobrara Convocation, um, which is a, a gathering of Indian, indigenous, native peoples um, that has been going on um, for years. And the work of the Episcopal Church and presence um, in, in indigenous, native communities and on the reservations is longstanding. I've been able to be with, with Episcopalians at Standing Rock. Um, where members of the Sioux tribe and all of the native, all of the tribes in the country, they say for the first time in a hundred years, came together um, to take a stand for protecting the creation and protecting sacred burial grounds. Um, and, and Episcopalians were, were in the lead of that and also in the lead in providing pastoral care and making sure that this was a nonviolent, peaceful way of making a point and not a harmful and destructive way. Um, I've, I've been able to travel the country and I'll be going, I'll be in Puerto Rico and um, the Virgin Islands after the, um, because of the, the hurricanes and, and Texas and that's kind of scheduled to be with our folk um, um, in distress um, where Episcopal relief and development is already there and on the ground. Um, one of, I think the Episcopal relief and development is probably one of the, they talk about instruments of communion in the Anglican communion. Episcopal relief and development is probably one of the instruments of unity in the Episcopal Church. Um, it is one of the best things that we do. Um, and to be able to, to know and have confidence that they are present um, strategically when disaster strikes, whether it's in the fires in Northern California, whether it was in the earthquakes in Mexico, um, whether it um, is the various hurricanes from Texas to Cuba to 
uh, Virgin Islands to Florida, uh, the whole Caribbean. I mean, the Episcopal Church is there. You are there. That's remarkable stuff. And then I get to go in the Anglican Communion. Just this past summer, I was... Um, and the other nice thing is I had a lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> Just a lot of them. And somebody asked me, where's your office? I said, it's the Delta Crown Room in the airport. <laughs> That's the real office. But I, this summer I was um, able to be in part of Central Africa, um, there to um, continue our relationship building with, with, other, with archbishops and, and the church there. But I was in Zimbabwe for the Bernard Mazeki Festival. Um, which, which has been going on for years. And Bernard Nozeki is really um, the person who is probably the father of Anglican Christianity in much of Central and Southern Africa. Um, he was originally from Mozambique and, and eventually um, found his way to South Africa and there um, received education at the hands of Anglican missionaries who saw something in him and he was eventually ordained and became a missionary. And this was the first time I had been there. I had heard of him and, you know, as a parish priest, I remember reading about Bernard Mazeki at the Midweek Eucharist. Um, and you may, may want to look him up, but Bernard Mazeki. Um, anyway, um, I got there and they asked me to come and preach. And the festival, 20,000 Anglicans gather for this festival. 20,000 Anglicans in Zimbabwe gather and they're outdoors and people sleep in tents. Um, and I've never seen, I've just never seen anything quite like that. Um, and when you preach, it's translated and they've got the mic systems all set up. And they got, they c gave communion to 20,000 people in less than 40 minutes. <laughs> they gave communion faster than I preached. <laughs> That's some of the breath, that's our, that gives me hope because the gospel is being proclaimed. The poor are being cared for. Ministry is happening in big and small ways and in remarkable ways. What, what's the challenge? I think our greatest challenge is what's before us in our wider culture and world. Um, and I can go into more into that, but I think that the challenge of our polarization in our culture, I was in Charlottesville um, after um, um, August 11th and after the, the tragedy there and spent time with your brother and sisters. We didn't make a big publicity out of it. It was a pastoral visit to spend time with the clergy and laity and the bishops of, that, of the Diocese of Virginia who were there. The Episcopal Church was there. When you saw neo-Nazis marching with tiki torches on that Friday night, do you know where they were walking to? They were heading towards St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which was hosting an ecumenical and interfaith prayer service praying for the community. That's your church. That's our church. That's us. And they were there the next day when, when, when neo-Nazis and Klansmen and supremacists were shrieking hate. Episcopalians were there with other people of faith and goodwill. And while hatred was being shrieked, they sang this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And they did. That's the church. And, but it confronts that and confronts a troubled society and a troubled country um, and trying to be a witness for the love of God for real that we know in Jesus. In that, in that vein, tell us a little bit about Ken Spellers and, and Bishop. Tell us a little bit about building beloved community. We're very excited about that here at the cathedral, but I'm not sure everyone quite knows the extent of this, this program, this idea, this movement within the Episcopal Church of building beloved community. Um, maybe I'll start out by inviting the presiding bishop to share. Can you all hear me okay? No. no. Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Let's see. I move this up a little bit. Does that help? Uh, keep maybe. going. It may pick up. I'll keep on going. Okay. And I'll also speak up a bit. Um, so I wanted to actually begin by inviting the presiding bishop to share with you some of the process for how we got to, and hopefully everyone has one of these cards. You've all got one of these, so go ahead and pull it out right now. We're going to be referencing it. Um, but if maybe the presiding bishop could sure. share with you about how we even came to the point where the Episcopal Church is making this commitment to, to long-term racial healing, reconciliation, and justice through the Episcopal Church and in the Episcopal Church. That's how you know you have a good staff when they say, maybe you would like to share. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not throwing them under the 
<laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, at, at this past general convention, I, I really do think something remarkable happened. We came out of, of, out of that general convention, if you will, with a mission agenda. We really did, with clarity about where we believe the church must go in this time, in this particular mission moment. And, and we really came out with, if you will, three priorities. That doesn't mean this doesn't include everything that we do as the church, but three priorities that need to guide us in the years ahead. And not just, not just for a year or two, but for the long haul. The first one was evangelism. That, that, that it's time for the Episcopal Church to reclaim its, its place in the public religious sphere um, and to be a presence for a way of being Christian that actually looks something like Jesus of Nazareth. That actually, you know, it would be nice to have some Christianity that kind of is about love. <laughs> Um, and, and this church is about that. And so it's time for a, a way of evangelism that reflects that, that shares some good news. And we need some good news. That convention came out with a commitment to that. They wouldn't have elected me beside Bishop if that wasn't at the top of the agenda. And they did. Um, and then in addition to that and more than that, um, um, not only evangelism, but the commitment to racial reconciliation. Um, literally, that convention happened in the shadow of the shootings in Charleston. I mean, that was on the hearts and minds of the people who were there. And there was a sense in which folks said, we can't keep going on like this. We've got to find a better way. And so a commitment to racial reconciliation, a, a real, a long-term commitment to healing um, our nation and bringing about reconciliation, that was a commitment. And then a third commitment was to care of God's creation. Um, that, 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 you know, he's got the whole world in his hands, but he's let us have a hand in it. And, and we got to help it. And so care for creation. So those three things emerged. And the uh, beloved community <laughs> that Stephanie is going to talk about actually reflects that work of racial reconciliation. And the church put money behind it to help to make it happen. So the, the church also, and I think this was a brilliant strategic move, where um, General Convention said, ah, okay, great. So General Convention said that they wanted um, for the presiding bishop, the president of the House of Deputies, the, and their, um, their vice presidents to come together and to do some unprecedented work. They said to them, you are our top leaders. Racial reconciliation is one of our top priorities. Go figure out a strategy, lead us. Yes, we need everybody else in the pews doing work. Yes, we need people continuing to do various trainings, but we also need a vision, a vision for who we could be as a church. And frankly, we need some courage because this is hard work, the work of racial healing, reconciliation, and justice. We can't do this without you all at the front. And so the presiding officers spent time together. They basically went on a retreat and some of us staff were blessed to be with them, um, including a priest in this diocese, Chuck Winder. Um, and, um, and we went and kind of accompanied the officers as they shared about what would a vision for healing look like for the Episcopal Church, a church that has been so implicated in the racial injustice, the history, especially of this country. This church gained more from the slave trade, more from, um, from Jim Crow, more from the systems of oppression that have, that have colored, colored the story of America. Our church has gained more from that than almost anyone. And so they said, that means we need to be out front on dismantling these systems of oppression and racial injustice. And so what they came to was something that, um, that we call the Becoming Beloved Community Framework. And if you take out your card on either side, what you'll notice is a labyrinth. You'll notice a labyrinth, and what we hoped is that when people see this labyrinth, immediately they begin to think, oh, this isn't a linear path. And we could say, no, it's not. It's not about do your training. How many of you have done anti-racism training of some kind? Um, how many of you had a clear sense after that of what you were supposed to be doing? Exactly. <laughs> a few. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> um, the fact is that for a lot of us, we do that training and we're not sure where it goes. We're not sure where the journey can lead. So what we wanted to do was make clear that, that there's actually a whole comprehensive journey that every one of us is invited into when it comes to racial healing, reconciliation, 
and justice. Again, not just reconciliation, not just let's all come together, let's all get along, but what does it take to stop the pain, stop the oppression, dismantle those systems, and build something that is beautiful, that is loving, that is healed, that is beloved community. So when you look here, what you'll see is what we imagine as the journey for that comprehensive transformation. And we know that it has to include telling the truth. It has to include all of us in the Episcopal Church saying, what have we done and what have we left undone around racial justice? Let's be honest. Let's be honest about the makeup of our congregations and why it is that the Episcopal Church is 90% white in a nation that is only, it's, it's actually under 70% white and, and by 2050, it'll be about 50-50 groups who had been minority and, and white folks. So why is the Episcopal Church so separate from that trend throughout the rest of our country? We need to tell the truth. We also need to proclaim a dream. Once we've said who we've been and acknowledged who we are, we can imagine together who we get to become. And that's that dream of beloved community. Can we host spaces all across this church where we can invite our neighbors to do some sacred listening and learning and imagining so that we have something beautiful and holy to move toward? If it's just about guilt, if it's just about we were bad, mea culpa, mea culpa, that only goes so far. If there's a dream of God that's in front of you, that's, that'll propel you through some hard work. And then we said, you've got to be practicing a way of love. When you know what it is that God is pulling you toward, can we become reconcilers and healers? Can we train to be these ambassadors of reconciliation? And we know you can't just decide to do that. You've got to train for it. So, so we imagine that the work of training to dismantle racism anti-racism trainings, that all of that becomes a part, again, not just of checking off a box, but practicing a way of love. And that we could begin to tell stories and to gather Episcopalians. The fact is that our church has about the same percentage Republican and Democrat of um, the rest of America. So we're like, so maybe we could also train to be reconcilers who help to heal some of the breach in our own country because we live that breach. We see those divisions in the life of our own church. If we could learn to tell stories about faith, race, and difference, maybe we could help our neighbors to do the same. And finally, as we train to be these reconcilers, let's go out and not just do the work internally, but let's go out and start repairing breaches all over this land. Repair the breach in the criminal justice system, repair the breach in our relationships with immigrants and undocumented and documented peoples, repair the breach and become truly sanctuary for our neighbors, because you better believe that if Jesus were walking among us right now and where he does walk, he walks with immigrants, he walks with undocumented peoples, he walks with folk who have been labeled as enemy in this country. So how do we repair that breach? Um, as a church, how do we take that systemic work seriously? So this vision for becoming beloved community is really about entering the labyrinth wherever you are. And we can talk in a moment about what that looks like for this cathedral. But whatever the work God has called you to, entering the labyrinth at that point and then continuing the walking. Don't stop walking. And even when you get to the center, to that resting place with Jesus, know that that's not the end. You get back up and you keep on walking through the transformation internal, and external, individual, communal, societal. And that's how we get to become the love of community. Amen. Thank you very much. We were just in Atlanta um, last week, I think, um, and uh, the, uh, at the um, Ephraim Jones Center for Racial Healing and Reconciliation, which the diocese there, um, and over a number of good people in Atlanta are really supporting, and we've partnered with them um, in their work. Dr. Catherine Me Meeks is just a wonderful, um, just an incredible woman. Um, and, but one of the things that was that, that surfaced there, and it just kind of surfaced in our conversations, was the realization that this becoming the beloved community, this is not about guilt. This is not about shame. This is not about finger pointing. 
This is about all of our story. And uh, just at that gathering, there were three bishops. Bishop Wright, the um, Bishop of Atlanta, um, who's African-American. He likes to call himself biracial, and oh, well, he actually is, but I mean, <laughs> biracial, but African-American. Um, the Bishop from Cape Coast, who's African, and, and then me. And I'm African-American too, but um, <laughs> you might not have noticed, but I am. <laughs> it's a, but uh, the three of us were there, and at one point, Rob Wright, the Bishop of Atlanta, um, um, said, you know, the Bishop of Cape Coast is a dear and wonderful man, and we were just, we were with him um, uh, uh, not, not a year ago in Ghana, and he will tell you, he will tell you that some of his ancestors sold slaves. And, and, and when he does that, it frees everybody to relax. This isn't about guilt. It's not about shame. All have sinned, and all really does mean all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the grace of God, the love of God, the healing power of God is meant for us all. And so this labyrinth, a prayerful way of engaging our racial divides, that's the underlying theme. And that's why this approach, I think, is a way of hope. Thank you. Amen. I want to ask you one more. We're going to take some questions from the congregation, but I want to ask you one more question. You were recently Bishop Curry at the Executive uh, Council, and uh, there were some statistics that were shared there, which I thought were fascinating, to say the least, that, um, in, that the mainline churches continue to shrink, the Episcopal Church being part of that, and that in, from 2015 to 2016, I think we lost somewhere around 35, 36 parishes in the church, and our, our um, congregation size reduced by about 30, 32, 33,000 members. And during the meeting, you made this quote, which I thought was very powerful, and I'd like you to elaborate on it a little bit. If we continue to navel gaze, you wrote, then we won't survive, and probably shouldn't. If our concern is being the church of the 1950s, maintaining an institutional reality for the sake of the institution, maybe we don't need to continue. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. The, um, um, the statistics are somewhat sobering, but I don't get depressed about it. Because I really know, I know that if we as the church move from looking at the statistics and saying, oh, woe is us, woe is me. As long as we're going, woe is me, we're worrying about the institution. Jesus wasn't about institutions. Institutions can serve his cause. Don't misunderstand me. But that's not what Jesus was about. Jesus started with 12 disciples and they weren't the most competent people God ever put on the face of the earth <laughs> and and they got the job done with with very little um, I mean it's really over the, our origins our deep origins are found in a community of people who committed their lives and their destinies to the way of this Jesus of Nazareth and they determined that they were going to follow his way as his followers as his disciples and they were committed to that and they changed the world they did I am convinced that if we focus on that, if we focus on forming people as followers of Jesus of Nazareth, on being followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and going forth into the world to make a difference, I guarantee you the numbers won't matter. This church will be fine, and we'll have every reason to be fine. That's what I was really getting at. We have every reason for hope, but it is a pragmatic hope. Actually, the hymn says, my hope is built on Jesus and that and he is the key and actually every Holy Week we remind ourselves even death couldn't stop him and if we're following him decline won't stop us either amen, amen. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you So we're going to take some questions from the congregation. If you'd like to ask either Ken Spellers or, or Bishop Curry a question, please just raise your hand and Michelle has some mic. As we're traveling, I want to thank you both for your support. 
We've partnered with the Episcopal Church, with the presiding bishop's office, and Canon Spellers in the conversations that we held on Sunday, last Sunday, and on Monday around racial reconciliation and listening sessions, having courageous conversations, and your support and help in all of that was incredibly beneficial. And so we're we're in we're in the labyrinth with you and happy to walk that way. So thank you very much. Thank God for doing it. Our, Thanks for doing it. To the environment, churches. Oh, the commitment, commitment to the, to the environment. environment. Um, that's emerging. The, church, the Episcopal Church has a long-standing commitment to the environment that takes on a variety of levels. On the one hand, there have been efforts throughout the church and, and all the dioceses to help congregations, both in terms of increasing awareness um, and also paying attention to what our footprint is on the environment. And that, so there have been local things that have been going on for a number of years. Um, the Episcopal Church, um, we um, have been participants um, at the climate change conferences in Paris, Marrakesh, and the upcoming one in Germany, in Bonn, I think. Um, the upcoming, we send a delegation. And actually, the Episcopal Church's delegation works with um, ecumenical groups, but we actually were the, um, the leading group, Bishop Mark Andrus and others, um, the leading group in creating a space where people could actually come and pray during the conferences um, and providing worship services um, for the conferences. Uh, we, together with the Anglican Communion, Archbishop Thabo from South Africa has been leading this effort where uh, Bishop, Archbishop Thabo was really instrumental in some of the diplomatic conversations um, in the Paris conference. So we participate on that level, and even as I speak, Linnea Main from our staff and our folk who represent us at the United Nations, um, we're an accredited agency um, in the UN world, um, is involved in some work around climate change. Um, we also, our Office of Government Relations, Rebecca Blatchley and the group here, try to join together with other ecumenical groups here in, in trying to impact um, our governmental leaders, both around climate change and environmental concerns. And then, I mean, this is probably more than you wanted, but, but um, our presence, the Episcopal Church was really present at Standing Rock with indigenous native communities um, who were trying to protect sacred land um, from a pipeline. And while they, they, they weren't able to completely stop that, their efforts have, have led to more collaborative relationship with the government there, um, with the state government. Um, 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 environmental protection is at least involved in the process now. Um, and so uh, there's some good things happened, but the religious community came around when the Episcopal Diocese there wrote, I remember they wrote me, it was in August of that year, and they said, would you come? Would you just come? And that visit, it helped. And the next thing we knew within a month, um, almost 500 religious leaders came. And, and, it, and it helped. And, and we've long been long standing in support of the Arct Arctic Wildlife uh, Preserve of the Gretchen people in Alaska. We just had the House of Bishops um, there and I was able to go and see where their lives depend on the land and on the caribou. Um, and if you start drilling for oil on, on the birthing areas of the caribou, you actually destabilize a people. Those Gretchen people, they're Episcopalians. They're Episcopalian, they're us. And the Episcopal, Episcopal Church has been standing with them um, for over 10 years now, and, and we're trying to continue that work. So that's some of the, of the work. Hi, you mentioned being in Africa, and I know there's been a lot of tension around the bishops in the continent of Africa with the Episcopal Church, and I wonder I know at one point they were trying to get us excluded from the Anglican Communion. And what are the relationships? Are they getting better? Yeah. Yeah, are the relationships getting better? They honestly are. Um, I'm, um, um, we, we, um, uh, I, I can tell you that there have been a couple of occasions when I've, I've, I've had to explain. I remember soon after our general convention when um, we um, expanded who could get married. We didn't change marriage, but we made marriage available um, to all who, who, um, who would faithfully enter into it. Well, th that was a big change, um, um, both, both here but, but around the world. And, and so it wasn't a, barely a year after our general convention made that decision. I was in Ghana, in Accra, a gathering of bishops and archbishops, and 
Um, and it was sort of an opportunity to, as we say in the South, explain yourself. Um, <laughs> and so I had to kind of share, you know, what our context is and why we did what we did and why we believe this is the right um, and compassionate and why we believe this is following the spirit of Jesus. This is the way of love getting lived out. We understand that others have different perspectives and we respect that. Well, there was absolute silence in the room when I was explaining that. And, you know, and, and um, uh, at one point I just had an extrovert moment and just forgot and just said, can I get an amen? And I did not get an amen. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was very clear at that moment. But, but then I said, now, we did that at General Convention, but let me tell you what we also did. And I went on and talked about our commitment to evangelism and being the Jesus movement, of really being the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. And one of the bishops said, said, wait a minute, did you just tell me that the Episcopal Church is into Jesus? I said, brother, that's exactly what I just told you. <laughs> um, and the conversation went on from there, not about what we disagree about, but about evangelism, uh, about climate change, because they are impacted profoundly by our decisions in this country about climate change um, and uh, about racial reconciliation because they were very concerned about Charleston at that time and that. So that has opened, I think, conversations and I'll be going back, I was in Central Africa and in South, in South Af Southern Africa um, just this past June and I'll be making a two week tour of Eastern Africa and am and, and being welcomed um, in some areas where it's been a little, uh, there have been concerns um, before, but I'll be going there and they're calling it a Jesus movement preaching mission from the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. So I think our relationships are growing. It will take work, it will take time, but I think I just came back from the primates meeting of the, the, the heads of the various provincial churches uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, and, and I can tell you that this was a collegial meeting. It was a meeting of people who have some disagreements. We, you know, we still have some disagreements, um, but um, it was a good meeting. Nobody left in a huff. Nobody was inappropriate. We agreed, we disagreed, we debated. And let me tell you, that was the week when the shootings happened in Las Vegas. I didn't know they had happened and I was walking in the hallway and one of the archbishops, an African archbishop, stopped and said, I'm so sorry. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And he told me what had happened in Las Vegas. And when we reconvened, the primates of the Anglican communion stopped what we were doing and prayed for the people of the United States and the Episcopal Church. And then they asked me, the archbishop asked if I would pray in the cathedral later at Evensong. That's a different atmosphere. We got our differences, but we're working on them. And as I tell the brothers and sisters, Jesus has some other work for us to do. Let's do it. <laughs> and I think folk are trying. We'll take one more question, then we've got to move on to the 1115. Uh, Bishop Curry will be preaching and presiding at the 1115 as well. I want to thank you, Bishop Curry, for allowing us to ask questions. And I'm so happy that you brought up the Las Vegas situation because my question is, has there been any communication with the White House, the Congress regarding gun control? Uh, yes. Um, we have, the Episcopal Church is not just on record. It's been active on diocesan levels. I saw, I saw, I saw your sign, I mean, diocese on the diocesan level. Um, there's a group of us of bishops against gun violence that has been, uh, probably was after Newtown, I'm guessing. I've, I've forgotten, I think it was after Newtown. Um, and um, that a while back it was called Bishops for Justice Society and then became Bishops Against Gun Violence. Um, and they've been active and working and petitioning and writing. Our government relations people are working. We work with ecumenical. It, this is a long struggle. Um, I, I can't tell you how many of, of my colleagues um, um, from Africa in, in countries that, you know, um, sometimes struggle with, you know, who's going to be in power and who's not. And they look at us and say, why do y'all have so many guns in your country? 
And so we've got to find a better way, on the one hand, to respect the, the Second Amendment. We all believe in that. On, on the other hand, people who are hunting and, you know, there's a legitimate, there are appropriate and legitimate uh, ways for gun ownership and responsible ways. When I was a kid, I learned how to shoot when I was a scout. Um, and it was the NRA that taught us, you know. So there's responsible gun ownership and possession. Um, but the way we're going now is not the way, and we can do better. And I, and I believe that we just have to keep working at it. It's, not, it's obviously not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be a quick change. But I really do believe that when people of goodwill keep working at it, eventually, sometimes, our leaders will follow their people. And that may take a while, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So we're going to get ready for the 1115 service now, but Bishop, would you pray us out so we can get ready to pray? Sure. <laughs> Great. Why don't everybody grab a hand? Grab, hold hands. Oh, great. Everybody got Dear Lord and God of us all, we thank you for bringing us together for the ministry of this cathedral and the community that supports it. We pray for our world, and we pray, Lord, that we may be witnesses to your love and your goodness, your justice, your compassion. So send us out, Lord, that as we've been blessed here, we might go forth to then bless this your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God love you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.